morning. Good morning. We welcome you to the house of the Lord this day, this November the 7th. Who are we? What are we about? We are St. John's, growing in Jesus and spreading his saving grace. And we have a Bible verse for this month. It's found on page 15 in your bulletin. As we prepare for calling the pastor, it's a reminder that God is the one who sets pastors in our midst. You find it from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. We do welcome God fishing. Uh, we're glad to have you back again. And we do receive a door offering in addition to the uh, uh, organist that we paid for our accompaniments. Veterans Day is coming. And we would ask all veterans and those who are immediate family members of a veteran, if you would please stand. Veterans and family members of veterans. We want to thank you for your service. Uh, it is a difficult service to, uh, to be in the military or to be a family member of one who is in the military. Uh, and we do thank all of you for the sacrifice that you undertake as a military family. And we also uh, thank you for the freedom that is being preserved. Shall we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of freedom in this land that you have entrusted to us. We know that freedom is the enemy of our enemy, the devil. And we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our freedom from sin, death, and the devil. And we thank you for the sacrifice of these and all the families who in times of peace and especially times of war, have given of themselves to preserve and enlarge this precious gift of freedom. Preserve our nation, we pray, and the gift of freedom that we enjoy. This we ask through Jesus, our Savior, the Prince of Peace. Amen. You may be seated. There are some cards on the table in, in Northex for our currently serving military members, and please take a moment to sign them Today. Memory Lights is coming up in December, and the request form is in your bulletin today. Uh, they are actually due this week. So if you uh, want to order a Memory Light ornament, please do so and get that form back to the Methodist Church. John Crowsey has an announcement for us today about our annual voters meeting. So it's that time of year again. Uh, our church voters uh, will vote on the budget and uh, salaries. Uh, this is here, one other thing. Uh, but we'll meet on Thursday evening, 7.30, down here at the North Wing. We need to have a quorum present. So uh, if you can, please come on down Thursday. I promise it won't be a difficult or a long meeting, but we'd like to have enough representation that we have a quorum. See you there. Thank you so much. Yes, it does help tremendously if we can have that voters meeting accomplished uh, on that Thursday night. So please do mark your both your calendars and come Thursday at 730. Our first song today is Sea of Galilee and may the Lord bless our time in his house today. Disciples sailed in fright, they were roaming on the Sea of Galilee. Stormy waves were rolling high, not for sure that they would die. Jesus came to them all walking on the sea. They were walking on the Sea of Galilee, and he caught the raging waves as plain to see. On the fourth watch of the night, Star was inside. Jesus, come. 
much sorrow, no hope for tomorrow. It's time like these you could really use a friend, one that you can run to time and time again. How do they make it without the Lord? Somebody tell me now. How do they make it without the Lord? Don't understand it now. How do they make it without the Lord? How do they make it without the Lord? Trouble. Everybody's got troubles hanging around like a big dark cloud. Heartache, it's enough to make your heart break. Too much sorrow, no hope tomorrow. How do they make it without someone to talk to? Someone who listens and really cares for you. How do they make it without the Lord? Somebody tell me now. How do they make it without the Lord? Don't understand it now. How do they make it without the Lord? How do they make it without the Lord? Everybody's got troubles. How do they make it without the Lord? Somebody tell me now. How do they make it without the Lord? Don't understand it now. How do they make it without the Lord? Somebody tell me now. How do they make it without the Lord? promises to those who trust in you. Grant us so firmly to believe in your Son, Jesus, that our faith may never be found wanting. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the Scripture lesson. Jar of flour was not spent. 
Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, that he spoke by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. The source from Hebrews 9, 24 to 28. For Christ has entered is not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places, every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the hearing of the Holy Gospel, and shall we join in the Alleluia verse printed on the top of the page? Alleluia! You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. In his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to them and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as Sylvia comes forward and shares with us the children's lesson for all. Children of God. Good morning. Good morning. Any question for today? Have you noticed that I start out my little time with a question? So my question for today is, how many of you have had a vivid dream? One that was so vivid that you woke up and you thought, was that really a dream or did that really happen? Anybody ever have a dream like that? I had one the other night. I was standing up here in front of you all and nobody had on a mask. <laughs> and I woke up and I thought, oh, it was a dream. How we look forward to when things turn out the way our vivid dreams turn out sometimes. Unless they're a nightmare. But that dream wasn't a nightmare. So what does that have to do with anything? Um, my lesson for today isn't related to or isn't tied directly to any of our readings. So I wanted to um, read where this is coming from. And this is coming from Revelation chapter 7. And I'm going to start with um, verse 9. And Revelation kind of talks about the end of, the, of times. And where do we land at the end of our time? Another question for you. Where do we end up at the end of our time? We 
We certainly plan on heaven, don't we, John? Exactly right. And that's what was going on here. St. Paul had a dream. And when he woke up from this dream, he realized it really wasn't a dream. It was God giving him a vision of what heaven is like. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes that were, and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and praise and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in the white robes, who are they and where do they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will spread His tent over them. Listen carefully to this part. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So when you hear those words, do you get a picture of what heaven looks like? I did a little bit of a Google search, and I put a Google search in for heaven. And this is what I got when I did a Google search for heaven. It's missing something. When I read these words from Paul, that God gave him this vision, this picture of what heaven was like, I'm missing the fact that we're not going to have any tears. We're going to be joyful, sing praises to God for eternity. I don't get that out of this picture. I do get very warm, fuzzy, comfortable feelings when I look at this picture. But I don't get the rest of the emotion of the joy that we're going to have when we're in heaven with all the rest of God's saints, with all the rest of our brothers and sisters who have come to know Jesus. And we don't want just us there. We don't want just the multitude that already know Jesus. We want to bring everybody else along with us that might not know how wonderful Jesus is and what great things he's done for us. So I challenge you this week to think about what heaven looks like to you. Yesterday I had um, a little bit of a, a sad twinge because four years ago yesterday my dad passed away. But then I thought, you know, I'm kind of sad because he's not here, but how joyful I am when I think about this picture that Paul has painted for us about where my dad is. My dad could never sing. He couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. But I know that he's in heaven, standing at the throne of Jesus, singing his praises to our one and only creator and the person, the one that gives us our eternal life. Please hold your hands and say the words of the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father thank, you thank you for giving us the faith in you, in you your, son, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. Help me to remember what a joyful time we will have in heaven. Help me to bring others along so that they too will know of your forgiveness and love that you sent to us through your one and only Son. In your precious name we pray. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I go back to my seat, we'll see the next song. Here's one you might actually know, and I, I give you kudos. Everybody did a good
Good job with a song you've probably never heard before. This one is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
There's that pesky Old Testament lesson for today. Another widow, this time with a son. Times are desperate. A severe famine. No relief in sight. No clouds on the horizon. No rain is forecast. All that she has are desperate times. Elijah, the prophet, is sent to her. He asks her for a little water. And as she is bringing it, he asks her for a morsel of food. She tells him there's nothing prepared. All she has, she says, is just enough flour and oil to make a small cake so that she and her son can eat it and then lie down and die. Did you guess what Elijah asked of her? No fear, he said. And then, here's what seems to be the really heartless part. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. Say what? But there's more. With God's generosity, there is always more. Elijah tells her, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. A near empty jar of flour. A near empty jar of oil. And a promise from God. What would you do? What would you do? Would you have listened to Elijah and make some food for him first, counting on the promise of God? Or would you have said, forget you, Elijah, there's enough for me and my son, and that's all. I'm not giving anything to you. quite a choice. It'd be a test of trust in the word of the Lord shared through the prophet Elijah. It'd be a test of the ability of the Lord to provide. What would you do? I wonder if often we're not more like this little girl. A mother wanted to teach her daughter a lesson on giving, and so she gave her daughter a quarter and a dollar before coming to church. Put whatever one you want in the collection plate and keep the other for yourself, she told the girl. And when they were coming out of church, the mother asked her daughter which amount she had given. Well, said the little girl, I was going to give the dollar, but... Before the collection, the man in the pulpit said we should all be cheerful givers. I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I gave the quarter. <laughs> so I did. Contrast that with the words of Martin Luther. I have tried to keep things in my own hands and lost them all. But what I have given into God's hands, I still possess. What's given into God's hands, we still possess. That's a lesson this little girl needed to learn. What's given into God's hands, we still possess. That's probably a lesson that we all struggle with when it comes to our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. What's given into God's hands, we still possess. Oh, we've certainly seen examples of this. There's that widow who put the two small copper coins, all she had, trusting God to provide for her needs for her daily bread. There's that widow at Zarephath who did prepare and give to Elijah something to eat 
and then prepared something for her son and herself, only to discover God can give and provide in ways we can never imagine. What's given into God's hands, she still possesses. Not to mention the example of Jesus. He came, he gave himself into God's hands. He did all that his life. He did that all his life. But certainly, most particularly in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And then later at the cross, he gave all, surrendering his body to the hell of the abandonment of his father. So that through trusting his salvation, we know forgiveness and eternal life. And then at the end, he cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And what he surrendered to the Father, his very life, he still possesses as he rose from the dead. You see, what's given into God's hands, we still possess. You see, God works in a different economy than you or I. We think what we give takes away from what we have, but in reality, nothing is truly ours. It's all God's, from the cattle on a thousand hills to the quarter a mother gives her daughter. Nothing is truly ours. It's only on loan from a gracious and a generous God who owns it all. And this generous and gracious God is one who loves to give gifts to his people. Out of his love and generosity, he has given us forgiveness in exchange for our sins. He's blessed us with resources far beyond our needs. Few of us are near our last meal nor have only two small copper coins to our name. God has blessed us generously. Have we yet learned what Luther experienced? What's given into God's hands, we still possess. I'm not promising that God will make you rich or return dollar for dollar or any silly thing like that. But what I'm saying is that it has always been my experience that placing our trust in our Father in heaven, He provides beyond our needs. And He blesses us when we invest in the kingdom. Try it out. See what happens. Give it time. And I'll bet you'll know the greater joy in giving and develop a deeper trust in our Savior who does provide. God does love a cheerful giver. But that doesn't mean that we should be stingy with God and only give what we can easily give. A broken and contrite heart is what God truly wants. And a heart broken by sin and rescued by the forgiveness of a gracious God. He, we already have the treasures of heaven. What gifts from our hands are a worthy response of His great love? Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We join in confessing the faith that God has planted in our hearts through the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's found near the bottom of page 9. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian. Normally, the tithes and offerings of God's people would be gathered.
as we receive them in the narthex as we enter and exit during this time. We join in the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We pray for the church, that those who serve her as ministers and all of her members, that we come with repentant hearts before the Lord and be grateful for the mercy that sustains us in this life and gives us life everlasting. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. We pray for our president, governor, congress, legislators, judges, and magistrates, that we be protected from our enemies and preserved in freedom to serve the Lord without constraint and with a clear conscience. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. We pray for the rich, that they may be grateful for their blessings and use them in service to those in need. We pray for the poor, that God would sustain them and keep them from bitterness and complaint. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. We pray for this congregation, our pastor, and all our parish leaders, that the Lord would equip us with a spirit of humility, that we walk in his ways and confess faithfully his gospel before all people. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. We pray for the sick and the suffering, the aged, the infirm, those in their last days, and those who grieve for those that they have lost. We pray especially for the family of Don Brocker Sr., who has passed away this week. We pray also for Sarah Binger and Alice Sheezer, for Peg Facklum, for Carl Mueller, and for Vic Vancouver, and for those whose first names we mentioned before you. Pray that the Lord grant them healing in accordance with his will, grace to endure the day of trouble, and peace of the last. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. With grat for gratitude and thanksgiving, that we use the resources the Lord has supplied to honor his name, and that we return to him the tithes and offerings he is due for all his mercies. Let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. Lord, there are people we know among our family and friends who need to know you or know your love more clearly. Hear our silent prayers for those who we know among our family and friends who we name in our hearts. Send the Holy Spirit to them to open their hearts to your loving grace and open our hearts and mouths to speak of our joy in trusting you as our Savior. Well, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you know the man you've chosen to lead St. John Congregation when Pastor Tice retires. Prepare that man for ministry here in our midst and prepare us for your ministry through him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for those who celebrate birthdays this week, including Tanya Torres Greenberg, Andrea Hamlock, Katie Hooding, Jacob Story, Ellen Plant, and Kimberly Pollard. As we are your children, Lord, renew our faith in your forgiveness, your presence in our life, and our response of faithfully living as your child. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the God of peace, who has brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ,
Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Our closing song. I first want to say thank you for the invitation to worship with you today. And God bless all you as well as this United States of America. Tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd heard